We will defer item 16 on page 67 until after our executive session. Uh, next on item 17, let me call on Chancellor McRaven to introduce <coughs> a report on admissions procedures at the UT Academic uh, Thank you very much, uh, Chairman. Uh, this afternoon, this morning, I'd like to have uh, Dr. Larry Faulkner present the results of the Blue Ribbon Panel, which uh, we formed on February 13th of uh, this year. And, and I do want to thank uh, Dr. Faulkner for sharing this. I also want to thank uh, time Executive Vice Chancellor Pedro Reyes, who kind of shepherded the effort. Um, and I, I do want to point out to the audience that uh, the, the Regents, these are not my final recommendations to the Board of Regents on the admissions policy, this is part of the process. Uh, we will take into consideration the Blue Room Panel, the White Paper, uh, the Crow Report, and then I'm going to ask uh, Dr. Steve Leslie to uh, talk to all the presidents, pull the presidents, and meet, uh, meeting the presidents. We will take all these things into consideration, and then at the August, at the August uh, board meeting, uh, I will present to you my recommendations for the admissions uh, policy. Uh, again, I do want to take the opportunity to thank uh, former Chancellor Dan Burke, who is a member of the panel, former Chancellor and President uh, Bill Cunningham, Obviously, uh, President Larry Faulkner, who chaired it, uh, former President uh, Peter Flan, and uh, former Chancellor Mark Udolph, who is uh, unable to join us uh, today, and again, Mr. <coughs> Reyes and, and his uh, ex officio staff role. So, without uh, further ado, uh, Faulkner, if I can turn it over to you, please. Thank you, uh, Chancellor. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Uh, it's my honor to speak uh, today, and uh, I'd like to acknowledge my partners. Uh, in this process, uh, former Chancellor Burke, uh, immediately to my right, uh, former Chancellor, former UT Austin President William Cunningham, to my left, former UT Austin and UT San Antonio President Peter Vaughn, uh, further to the right. Uh, as the Chancellor mentioned, we also had with us, uh, not today, but with President Burke, uh, former Chancellor Mark Udoff, who is also former president of the University of California and the University of Minnesota. The full text of the panel's report was furnished to you in advance, so I'll just cover main points here, setting the stage for questions. The Blue Ribbon Panel on Admissions was appointed by Chancellor McRaven in February with a three point charge. We met all the points with unanimous agreement on substance and language. The panel began by articulating fundamentals upon which any system of practice regarding admission should be built. Here are our main points concerning presidential responsibility and authority. In Rule 20201, Section 4, the Regents have defined the President's duties elaborately and clearly. The President has general authority and responsibility within the bounds of regional and system level policies and oversight. In the panel's view, the admission of students to a public university is a central process bearing strongly on the institution's public identity and service to the people, the quality of its academic programs, and its external academic standards. The panel does not believe that a firewall should seal the President off from important duties in this area. The office has many responsibilities in which public trust is invested. We do not accept <coughs> the argument that the president's work regarding admissions is so risk-laden that he or she should be removed from it. The panel members agree that a well-earned reputation for integrity is a priceless asset of a public university. <coughs> The President's top priority regarding admissions must be to assure that the work is actually carried out and is broadly understood to be carried out with the best achievable fairness and validity. <coughs> to the extent that confidence in admissions practices has eroded, we judge that the answer is an improved presidential <coughs> accountability, not the removal of this one duty from a president who otherwise is fully responsible for the well-being of his or her institution. Now I turn to the President's involvement in the annual admissions cycle. The panel believes that it is appropriate for the President to be involved in planning and policy development prior to and during an admissions cycle. 
from time to time when the president has relevant knowledge, he or she might also participate in the evaluation of the student's credentials. The members of the panel judge that this is an acceptable practice. The president has a depth of experience and range of responsibility that qualify him or her fully for such work. Nevertheless, we advise that with rare exceptions, the president leave to the admission staff the final evaluation of credentials after he or she has come. Having an able senior professional in charge of the annual process of undergraduate admissions is important to the institution and to the president. A university is best served when this person has clear delegated authority for normal operations, including related decision making. Even so, there may be individual cases in which the president disagrees strongly enough with the admission staff to make an independent final decision on an applicant's admission. The members of the panel believe that the president now has this authority under the region's rules and should retain it. The evaluation of issues is complex. And the president needs always to have the ability to act optimally and properly for the institution as he or she judges within the parameters of the holistic admissions process. But decisions to override the outcome of the regular admissions process should be taken judiciously and rarely. Toward accountability, the members of the panel recommend that the chancellor require of each president a face-to-face -face personal report at least once per year to discuss admissions cases in which the president made an independent final decision. If the chancellor is not satisfied with the president's approach and actions, the chancellor has options for follow-up. Panel members believe that admissions is not an area in which open records offer an appropriate avenue of accountability. By its nature, an admissions process deals uh, individually and personally with applicants. Each has the right to expect the institution to hold in confidence their identities and information. This is the reason for our emphasis on a mechanism of accountability built on direct face-to-face -face reporting and discussion. Let us now turn to the handling of letters and calls, sometimes called unsolicited communication. In the experience of the panel members, there is no harm in most of this communication. The majority of the letters simply convey information of the kind normally found in supporting letters without any suggestion of request for special treatment. The panel report speaks in detail to the recommended handling of letters, email, messages, or calls in various categories toward brevity uh, with the details here. Rare letters and calls involve attempts at undue influence. The panel judges that an unsolicited communication manifests an attempt at undue influence if it involves any coercion of institutional personnel. Many such cases are not egregious and can be disarmed by the president. Others simply become moot because of the applicant's own success in the process. In any case, the president has a clear duty to protect the admission staff from any part of coercion. If, in a very rare case, there is coercion based on a serious <coughs> credible threat to the university's future, the panel recommends that the president consult in a timely manner with the chancellor, the executive vice chancellor for academic affairs, and the chairman of the board. With regard to admissions to professional degree programs, the panel's views are simple. Deans should, by presidential delegation, be principally responsible for admissions to the professional programs in their schools, with roles and responsibilities mirroring those of the president regarding undergraduate admissions. Now I turn specifically to the Kroll Report. 
The panel does not see the necessity to institute policies that are sharply restrictive with respect to the number and sources of supporting letters in a student's file. But if an institution judges that policies are needed in this area, we urge that they be made simple and easily explained. The panel members are in agreement with Kroll's recommendation to establish a policy that unsolicited communication should not unduly influence admissions decisions. The panel agrees with Kroll's recommendations regarding inquiries from third parties. The privacy of a student's record, including his or her application for admission and its status at any time, must be guarded with care. The panel does not agree that the president should be precluded from judicious, rare, independent actions in admissions cases for good and sufficient reason. Moreover, the panel believes that it is unwise to place the Office of Admission in the role of judge over the president's actions, as Kroll suggests. The chancellor and the executive vice chancellor for academic affairs are the proper agents of accountability. Kroll speaks extensively about the system of holes in the Office of Admissions at UT Austin. While the panel recognizes the legitimate administrative needs that gave rise to the procedures, it is amply clear that this system is no longer appropriate, for it feeds mistrust in the integrity of the process. The panel recommends that it be abandoned. All efforts should be made to avoid tagging any student's file, except as needed, to meet internal needs of the admissions process itself. Presidents and deans will still want and need timely information about the outcomes of admissions cases, but the mechanism for assuring their notification should be separated from the individuals and the tools involved in the actual evaluation and decision making. The panel agrees with Kroll that there is no need to establish elaborate admissions committees. The members do believe that admissions processes should involve collaborative decision making among multiple qualified parties. Finally, we turn to the white paper on admissions. The panel agrees that each institution should revisit and update its written policy governing admissions. We are not in agreement with all elements recommended in the white paper for inclusion in such a policy, but I've already covered our points in this agreement. The white paper also includes recommendations for best practices under five headings. Ensure transparency through the admissions process, identify for prospective students the criteria used in holistic review, promote consistency in holistic reviews, uphold the integrity of the admissions process by eliminating external influences and conflicts of interest, and encourage accurate and timely communication between students and staff. The panel fully endorses the points in the white paper under four of the five headings, one, two, three, and five. The members support the goal expressed for the fourth heading, which is the one on conflicts of interest and external influence, but not most of the provisions in the related text. We suggest alternatives that we believe to be superior. Admissions processes at a highly selective public university in Texas are intrinsically complex. Practical policies applied with integrity and sound judgment are essential. The panel has endeavored to deliver a report that can be useful over time for those who must develop such policies and carry them out across the University of Texas system. This concludes our briefing. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Faulkner. I really do appreciate the time and effort that you guys put into this. It means a great deal to us. And just the integrity that you guys have as a panel and the experience and knowledge that you have. It's a great deal to us. We'll take this under advisement and be back to you in due course.
who's out in West Texas and met a young man or woman and said, you know, wow, this person has just fabulous, interesting things about their life that may not show up on the traditional resume. Are we supposed to say, no, we can't take that into consideration? In the same way, if a Nobel Prize winner is a riot and say, you know, I met this young lady and she comes from a different background, but the way she thinks about science is just unique. And it's just the way that I think is going to change the world we live in. Are we supposed to say no? That he, he's not teaching at high school? That just seems silly to me. So in that sense, I think you need to come back and focus on the holistic process and realize that's what makes it work. But a quid pro quo, not acceptable. You just can't, can't go there. And I never saw it in all my, I only really did this for 15 years, but I never saw it. Well, I wasn't suggesting that the, that the contrast would, would be that, uh, that stark. Um, I think certainly the examples that you cite clearly bear on the merits of the individual um, and not the- But they wouldn't show up in the traditional ACT score, SAT score, high school rank, that kind of thing. Sure. And so you have to be able to look beyond that. If you don't trap yourself in a way that you will not admit, but that will all you will fall in within the merits of the individual. In my mind, they do. Sure. Well, um, thank you very much for your report. Um, I'm sure you are all familiar with the, uh, the June 2004 document, which is the proposal to consider race and ethnicity in admissions that UT Austin submitted to the board for approval, which was- I signed it, yes, okay. So, <laughs> um, and, 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 and as, you know, when, when we talk about a clear line of, of you know, of who gets in and who doesn't, while I completely agree with you on it's not a clear line on who's qualified and who's not qualified, the process that's, that's designed and the one that we, uh, uh, you know, we were imposed upon affidavits and interviews is that it is incumbent upon the admissions process the holistic reading where all the files are read together. If you apply to one school, you're going to be, you're going to be a competition for those other kids that apply. Your files are going to be read at the same time. And everybody gets a score. The AI and PAI or the matrix. There's your score yourself. And then the admissions process goes through and it puts their step one. Everybody on one side gets an offer. Everybody on the other side gets denied. And the policy shows that any one person, any applicant in a cell that gets an offer, everybody in that cell needs to get an offer. One's denied, all denied. So, you know, there is a clear red line on, on who gets in through the holistic process. The, the but there's judgment involved in your creation of the cells in the first I agree 100%. But the problem, the, the, the problem that Kroll identified was that the holistic process was set aside, it appears to, to some of us, and because no one item should get you in underneath all of our testimony. And, uh, but in fact, that outside uh, of the holistic process, you know, seats were added and, and, and kids were accepted in front of others that had scored higher. And, and I'm trying to understand what circumstances might exist to where an applicant who was next in line for CMC gets denied what they have earned because a politician or somebody with a better, better access to the president's office gets that seat. I don't understand how that is, is uh, ever acceptable. Well, I don't think we actually uh, advocate that. Well, but but so what, other than the president being involved in setting the policy, which was, which was established, I mean, that, that's what happened, that's what we did, that's what it's supposed to be, that's what we've already approved. How, how can the president be involved beyond that without doing something different than the policy already allows? I mean, in what circumstances should they, should she or he ever intervene? Who happens to be in front of another applicant? I hear it. That the president is the chief admissions officer. Somebody has to be in charge. As President Bush used to say, somebody has to be the decider. Somebody has to make a decision. 
And someone may weight that letter from the Nobel Prize winner one way, the president may weight it another way. The president weights it one way, he may be in one cell, weights it another way, maybe in another cell. And I don't find anything inherently wrong with that. Uh, if someone has to be the final decision maker. And it's not, and it is a holistic process. It's not just based on SAT scores, high school rank, those kinds of things. So many factors. I, I, I understand that. But the problem is, is that the holistic process will have concluded by the, either the letter It's not all done the same day. It's not how it works. It right. can't be. No, it's not how it works. It's not possible. possible. I, I, no, I, I understand that. But at some point, the class is full. And then what we're talking about are spots that are at after the fact. I mean, when, when, when the track meet is run on Saturday and there's 100 winners, there's also a 1v20 loser. Yeah, and I used to work for a guy named George Kazmetsky, who used to say, hey, you never make a decision until you have to. And if you made a decision of wrong, change it. And so the president of the university realizes at some point that through some process, whatever it was, that a chief admission officer runs up and says, Mr. President, we messed up. We didn't see this letter from the Nobel Prize winner. We didn't understand the facts of this case. We'd like to add one more person to the class. I'm not burdened with that. That's just not a problem. Life is just not definable in that way. In a big university like UT Austin, it's just not that simple. So to say that we're going to admit two more people because we got information as I say, many times, not to the president's office, to some other vehicle, that's just not a burden for me. We need to make the best decisions we can with the information we had at the time. That's correct. And uh, we, uh, with respect to uh, uh, the investigative part of the parole report, we did not revisit that at all. Our charge was to speak to uh, the future, uh, how to operate um, with the best effectiveness and integrity uh, and admission system going forward. That's what our report focus on. So we have nothing to say about the investigative part of the program. Anything that Peter or uh, Dan would like to do? No, I think it's been properly covered there, and those are good questions. I'm a business person of background, and I find this situation really relatively simple. You develop good, solid policies that are approved by the board or whoever needs to approve them. You hold your chief executive officer accountable, and there are accountability measures built into this report, whereby the president has to come to the chancellor and discuss these issues, on an annual basis. I have run a number of large enterprises and I would hate to think that I would ever have to build a firewall between my chief executive officer and any part of that operation. Totally against that. Both my family and in that accountability process, that president or those presidents are going to have difficult decisions. And some of them are going to be a little gray. There are no bright lines. As the chairman here said. So you have to give them a little flexibility. And once a year, when he comes in to discuss this with the chancellor, those issues should be discussed. And if the chancellor's not happy with the way that's running, he holds that president accountable. Thank you. In my years, uh, we had calls and we had letters. We also had the Provisional Admissions Program. Uh, this was a program by which any graduate of an accredited high school who did not meet the admission <coughs> standards could enter in the summer, and if they took certain courses and achieved a certain grade point average, they would be regularly admitted in the fall. And that took a great deal of, of pressure off of the system. At that time, also, the legislature hadn't entered the admissions uh, uh, policy arena. I didn't like to say no, absolutely, to anyone. And if they, for one reason or another, did not qualify for the 
provisional admissions program or didn't want to enter the provisional admissions program, uh, we tried to develop a plan by which they could eventually transfer into the university. We would recommend, for example, that they go to Temple Junior College and take certain courses, and if their grade point average was acceptable, uh, they could transfer in. Uh, it's very